Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Now I Know. In this interview series, like we promised, we're going to be delving deeper into one of the most asked questions and topics that you guys want to know about, which is the new BT internship program or the Bas Steering that came to replace the Almanschen Steering, otherwise known as the AT. And uh, this internship has a lot of questions coming with it. How is it structured? How to get admitted to it? Where to apply? Can you divide it up? Are you paid while you're doing it? So all these questions are going to be answered by a fellow colleague and a fellow now ophthalmology colleague as well, Dr. Dawood Ahmed. Welcome. Welcome to this channel. Thank you so much for being part of this interview. Thank a quick you, intro Andy. about uh, Dawood that uh, he's... Uh, started his residency in ophthalmology in the north of Sweden after a long process, no shortcuts. And uh, he's going to tell us uh, all about it and specifically about the BT. Welcome, my friend. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, on your channel and on your link. I'm pretty sure I as myself used to uh, see your videos sometime and it's a, it's a great source of inspiration and great source of information for all the people who are wanting to uh, come into the system and hopefully work in Sweden at some point in their life. Um, so welcome. Thank you, you're making me blush. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Davud and um, I am uh, I'm, uh, from Pakistan. I took my uh, basic medical education from Pakistan. And uh, since then, I have moved to Sweden for about like four years ago, uh, back in 2017. Uh, and since then, it's been yeah a bit of, I wouldn't say a straightforward journey for anyone coming from outside the EU. It's a very lengthy process and you have a lot of obstacles in your way. Um, but if you keep motivated and if you know what you're doing and you have a plan, everything comes to you and eventually it pans out. Uh, and I have just started my residency in ophthalmology, uh, and I believe it's one of the best specialties out there in the in the in the field of medicine. I couldn't agree more. Um, mm -hmm. So if we jump right into it, um, you had to go through a couple of steps before you reached the BT. But to summarize it, as I understood, you learned the language, you did the Kunskap proof. Am I correct about that? So we talked about these in prior interviews. If you guys would like to check it out with mm -hmm. the, uh, Dr. Diego Cardenia, check it up uh, up on this link specifically about the Kunskaps proof. In this one, we're going to be talking about the Bete. So what is this Bastian steering and how do you apply to it? <clears throat> yeah, I will, needs it? <laughs> yeah, I will begin with correcting it a little bit. Uh, you said in the beginning that uh, it's replacing Ote. That's not exactly true. Uh, Bete is like uh, a part of the new Este, so that uh, you're not Ote, uh, like Ote is something that you do before you are a licensed doctor. Uh, the difference is that Bete is uh, something that you would do as a licensed doctor, so, so that anyone having a license uh, can do a Bete. And Bete is like an integral part of the new Este, like we have different uh, types of Estes, like different patterns or like I don't know how to say it in English but like it's a uh, it's a set of things that we have to do to get a specialist competence and they have updated it for 2021 and in the 2021 the first year roughly saying you can do it later as well but like the basic part of the new specialist training in Sweden that would be called Bete and it's not actually a replacement of Ote but it's like in crude words, you can say it's more or less the same thing, but just with a different name. Uh, but there are some differences to begin with. Uh, so that's the basic introduction. So if you're going to do the new ST2 2021, then Bete is a part of your ST. So it's not a, like something yeah, something that is just like an Ote that you have to do to get your license and then you can apply for an ST. It doesn't hinder you in, in that way. You can apply an ST. You can do your bet in, in the beginning. You can do your bet in like the middle of your estate. So it's very flexible. Uh, it's not like uh, audit. So that, that's number one thing to you. To, uh, I see. To so just, just to capsulate on this moment. So uh, bet is not uh, uh, mandatory to be done before you apply for estate. Not at all. As a non-European graduate. 
if you come to so if you come to Sweden, what they require from you is the language and the kunskap or or or, or the, the medical exams, and then yeah. you can apply to BT through as a part of your AT or oh, sorry as a part of your ST. Exactly, education. exactly. Okay. So that's if we if we make it like easier for everyone to understand. There are like two types of uh, BT or like two types of ST. How do you want to say it? So one, you have like a freestone BT, that we say, uh, uh, you call it like a, a independent BT, where you're not linked to an ST. The other one is that you have a BT as a part of your ST. So if you apply for a training position, let's say, for example, it's very easy to apply and get in like Almond Medicine or the general practice. And most of the clinics or like wards and all, uh, they offer like uh, some sort of form of ST with BT is included in that so that when you when they hire you uh, they know that you have to go on like uh, placements some we call running and then you do like your BT as a part of your ST so it's like it's very flexible and the other difference that I just realized is that OT is teed still they will say uh, uh, that is time dependent that you have to do like 18 months and 21 months and like that de depending on which region that you're applying for Bete is not time dependent uh, it's like goal dependent like mol riktad so you have to fill like certain goals that i have the base competence to you to go go further with my specialist training so that's another difference if you look at social students and they would recommend uh, to do a bete for one year uh, but uh, they, they don't like set it like you have to do one year you can do it up to six months as well and uh, depending on your previous experience it can be counted but there are certain details that uh, all the different states they really want you to work for one year because of different reasons but it's not a law um, uh, that you have to do it for one year you can do it in six months so the minimum required is six months minimum required is six months Okay. And you can you can count your previous experience as well, depending on your uh, study handle that uh, your like supervisor. But who de who, de who decides if that prior experience is recognized? Is it the social uh, citizen or is no, it... no, no? Basically, uh, so as long as you get your certificate signed uh, by a supervisor, everything is good and fine. And they never look at how much time you have done. I mean, it's a, if you do like a beta, you have to do six months. That's you have to keep in mind. But if it's six months or seven months or eight months or nine months, it doesn't really matter. But most of the programs offer like a standard set where you have to do like one year, uh, irrespective of what you've done before, because it's very difficult to like uh, do it a tailored beta just for you. So a lot of people just like, yeah, this is how we do it. And uh, and it's just easy for everyone to just follow that. Okay, the big elephant in the room is, um, so what what does this BT include? Is it internal medicine? Is it ophthalmology? What is it? What does it include? In fact, it's it's a very good question. And then again, the difference from OT is like OT, you have like blocks. You have a medicine block. You have a surgery block. You have a psychiatry and a ward central. Here, uh, you don't have anything. It's very vague. Uh, what they want you to do is they want you to fill out the to fill the checklist like uh, their goals what they expect uh, from you and if you uh, google like st 2021 you can get their checklist uh, on that and you can read about and then, then social studies is very like vague and uh, when you read about the different types of goals that they've written you would be confused even more they would say like you need to know the basics of acute and like non-acute diseases what does that mean does that mean surgery does that mean medicine does that mean psychiatry does that mean ward central you don't know so that's the thing this is like uh, uh, depending on what you want to do further a lot of people can like um, uh, customize it to what you need because if you say like i want to be a psychiatrist you can see like an acute psychosis and that fills out the more like acute diseases. You want to be a GP? Yeah, you can uh, have some, like you have acute pus at your GP clinic, and then you can fill out criteria that, oh, I have seen an acute patient. So it's very individual, but uh, what I can say, what I did, and what most of the people in different states are doing, is that you have some sort of like uh, a hospital-based experience where you are in a ward or where you are in an acute mutogning, 
or some sort of like a, a psychiatric clinic and then you have some sort of placement at a ward central so basically it's more or less like you you are inspired from Ate, but you're like flexible in what you're doing and not everyone is doing the same stuff so for example for me uh, i did my bete uh, in malmo at the Skåne university hospital and I did mine at uh, the emergency department and where we have the both surgery medicine and like orthopedics and like uh, eye and ENT. And then I had my hospital based uh, rotation in vascular surgery and further on in psychiatry and then in, uh, in a GP practice. That was the last one for me. But like I said, if you meet someone else, they have probably done like something in the in, in the infection clinic and someone who has been on the ENT ward and rounds. And so it's it's very variable. So you can't say this, this is, is so interesting. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's it's really uh, you get to choose a bit how you want to have that this bit of experience. To a certain yeah, extent. depending but on <laughs> which which region you are applying, some regions are more flexible okay. than others. Okay, so uh, how, how do you apply? How would someone right now that uh, has just completed the Kinska proof, how do they apply? Is there a website you go on to apply for beta program uh, or you have to? Anyone who is a licensed doctor, it doesn't really matter if you are from Europe or like outside the EU, uh, as long as you have a license to practice and um, you want to do your specialist training in Sweden and you have not done a Swedish OTE, irrespective if you're from Denmark or Norway or Iceland, these Nordic countries or like from Romania or Bulgaria or like from any place in the world, as long as you have not done a Swedish uh, Almenskjensjöring. So you have to do this Bete. And the way you apply is basically uh, you you find the uh, like uh, an ad for, for the candidates. And it's like, you have to search on like Platsbanken or Arbetsförmedlingen website, or you can like put yourself on the alerts for different regions. And then, then when they have a placement for you, they will just email you and let you know that we are taking applications for a Bete, both uh, a freestone like independent and as a part of the new Este. And a lot of GP clinics, what I know, they have been offering like a, uh, Bete as a part of the new este so that's also something to look out for so that you don't miss on the opportunity you don't have to wait like an Ate or I will start my career when I will get a Bete you don't have to do that so what, what I if I understand correctly is that you can go on the Arvetsu Medling uh, website is that mm. correct mm. and there you can either find Bete posts like GP clinics are offering Mm, as a part of your estate so like they're as a part of that like it's a package deal. Like, it's a package exactly it's a package deal okay in your yeah, case then, when if you wanted the intern like uh, let's say i'm interested in internal medicine or to become an ent specialist in the future mm -hmm. how would i go by that is it also on this website or should i contact what would you advise should i contact the hospital directly and, and ask because this this is very new right now and a lot of people don't really know what what it means and how you go about it so my personal advice is if you are into house hospital-based specialities just get your uh, beta done like uh, the independent one because your clinic would not have any uh, like interest to make a package for you because it's just not how things work sorry but that's how how the reality is I mean, I would really like to have it. If you want to do ENT, you may, may get like a placement of a bete at acute done or like a plastic surgery placement or something like that. That is, re that is relevant to your ST, but it doesn't work that like that. You, for that, uh, my advice would be like, just get your, just apply to your uh, ENT clinic, and, but have that in mind. Even if you start your ST, you have to do bete at some part. Uh, before you apply for a specialist competence you have to do it they recommend that you do it in the first two years of your estate so okay uh, let's say that uh, i want to because when you go into your specialty like say as a, as a as an ent you're working as well with an internal medicine and different scopes and you're doing surgery you're doing a lot of uh, different things um different than how it is for example in ophthalmology where you're just in ophthalmology so um, would they would they accept 
or do you know if they would accept that your hand leader or your mentor during your estate they mm. would sign off on on that you completed this checklist of your beta through your essay or it has to be separate it has to be extra i would time believe added. it has to be it, they can't just sign it off because there are a lot mm. of courses that you have to do uh, in beta in beta like uh, they have moved okay. a few of the este courses from like este to the beta like for and casas course and palliative medicine and like uh, all this stuff is now moved to the beta so you can't really expect them to sign off everything for you uh, because you have to go on certain courses that the clinic has to pay for uh, and that's why i said it's easier to just get it like the in the freestanding one like where you are just done with it because the clinic has like, ex how can you expect a clinic from uh, ENT to arrange like a course in palliative care when like they are not really bothered? Let's just say like, for example, any specialty where you don't have a lot of palliative patients. So that would be really hard to like uh, take it through when you're doing your rest there. Like clinic uh, pathology, for example, uh, or something like a lab-based specialty. I mean, you don't get to deliver bad news when you're working in those sort of fields, but you still have to do your bete. So my personal advice would be uh, someone who's looking to do a training in uh, GP, that's just, just go for the este, which has like a bete included. If you're into hospital-based specialities, uh, apply for a independent bete and then you can continue with your este. It would be easier that way. Yeah, and even those independent betes, they're also uploaded on places like Arbets and Medzing, correct? Or not yeah, so much? Yeah, they are. They're you you can like basically yeah. go into the filter function and like you used to do for like, a, I am looking out for jobs for a Estelacre. You can do the mm. same for a Estelacre. Mm. So you can mm. just go and search mm. for it and like filter it and then you will get all the results. For more information about what Arbets for Medling is, it's basically um, a national website and actually European Swedish based website that where it's a job bank and uh, you can apply there and you can see different jobs as a job seeker or even as an employer but this is very important and thank you a lot for this advice this is very very important so basically guys try to choose from what i understand the quickest way to achieve what your goal is and if you want to go into gp take the package deal if that's a good idea if if it suits you just get this beta thing out of the way and uh and move forward and it's a good i i personally believe it's a good experience um i didn't um uh, at the time when i started there wasn't something called bete and for my colleagues that went into internal medicine um had they have had they had this six months or one year of experience before to kind of you know smooth them into the system it would have been easier down the, uh, down the road. So I personally don't see it as a negative thing. But what about you? How, how was your experience through it? Uh, I would I would agree with you. I would 100% agree with you. Because if you're someone uh, who has not worked in Sweden before, and, and you just come in and start working as a resident, it's it's a quite challenging position to take on uh, in the very beginning. You don't know the system. You know, You don't know how the system works. Even if you're really good at your like uh, theoretical knowledge, a lot of the stuff that we do is basically based on following the guidelines uh, and like uh, the understanding the system, how the referral system works, and how are you supposed to follow up patients and everything like that. Like the practical stuff, you don't you don't you don't have that background when you have not worked in Sweden. Uh, and for me, I would say. Uh, it's it's a it's a definitely a plus system for anyone who's uh, completely new to the system. I would hundred percent recommend it. Uh, but there are some people like myself. Uh, I had already worked for almost about two years in Sweden when uh, they changed the laws and they said now you have to do the bete as well. For me, it was more like a step back because I have already got into the system and I was working at a higher position and then I basically got downgraded. Uh, and for me, it was like a, a very relaxed year, I would say. Uh, but still, I got to learn a lot of new stuff uh, and stuff that I previously did not have the opportunity to, to, to learn. And the good part is basically all the stuff that you learn in Bete is, is the same stuff that you can apply in your Este. So you have like different um, instruments for assessing your progress. And they are exactly the same uh, as in Este. 
So beta basically prepares you for a, for a S test. So I would say 100% go for it if you if you find a place. That's very, very well said. Very well said. And uh, the other elephant question in the room, probably the most question that I've gotten <laughs> on this channel, is beta paid? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, 100%. Uh, it's paid. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, from Lacker Verbundet, that's basically our organization for like taking our like our voice for the doctors in Sweden. They recommend that a BT uh, doctor should be getting the same pay as an ST doctor. So that's another difference from AT. Because AT, you have uh, quite a less bit of uh, uh, economical um, incentive. A BT lacquer is the same as an ST lacquer. But uh, in a lot of situations, you get like a few thousands less than an ST lacquer. That's, that's how it is. But a few thousand kron. You mean. A few so thousand, it, yeah. A few hundred dollars less than than what an Estelacker would make uh, in a month before tax. But exactly, exactly. Yeah, and does uh, do, do you know that does the salary vary depending on which region in Sweden or, or which kind of state oh, yes. in Sweden oh, you do yes. your beta? Oh yes, it's just exactly like the Este, uh, and uh, like the variation in the Este is the same variation is in the beta as well. When I did it. Uh, I applied for um, oh, a certain amount of regions and I know you get uh, paid a lot more in the north of Sweden. Uh, and it's it's uh, definitely, if you're on a budget and if you don't really care about anything else, I would say just pack your bags and move to the north. You would have it a lot easier, not just because <laughs> of the pace, but because people are a little bit more accommodating as well here. Mm -hmm. And the pay that one would usually get, even if it's in the South, uh, would it be enough to cover the main cost of living? Like you're saying, not luxury life, but the main cost of rent. I mean, it depends on where you're coming from. If you're used to like mm. driving a luxury car and something like that, no. Uh, mm. It would be barely enough to survive. But that's uh, how the reality is. We have uh, something... Yeah called like Yente Lagen here that everyone has to be like more or less the same uh, level. Uh, and basically you would have the life of an average Swede, uh, but nothing fancy, nothing less, nothing more. That's how it would be. So in summary, when it comes to salary and pay, what you would expect during your pete is uh, marginally slightly less than what you'd be getting during your este. And just to like uh, uh, continue to just capsulate on that, during your estate, your salary would increase year for year by year. It would be higher if you do hood. Talking about hood or night shifts, do you get to do night shifts and duties during uh, your bete or no? Like I said, it's uh, it's very flexible. I, I didn't mm -hmm. do it because uh, the, the state where I was working in, they were not willing to pay for extra work. Uh, but uh, in uh, within the same state, in a different hospital, my colleagues have done that, and uh, they have gotten the same uh, uh, compensation as you would get in an ST. So at, uh, I didn't do any night shifts, for example, uh, but I did uh, uh, evening shifts. But then I got paid the same way as an ST that they just move forward your um, timings and that you get paid for like the last three or four hours and that's not a lot of money uh, to be honest but uh, certain certain of my colleagues they, they they got paid for night shifts as well and they work nights in bed there so it's it's very variable but uh, what i can say in like the big regions in the big cities um they they don't really want to pay you for extra work because you're basically someone who's tagging along you don't have your own responsibilities uh, and someone has to like uh, guide you and like uh, uh, make sure that you are safe uh, for the patients. Uh, so there's not really a point that you would be working nights because at nighttime, all of the hospitals are in like reserve mood. They're not there to train people at that time. They're just basically there to just clear off the patients, like provide the absolute uh, necessary care. So that's how it is. But I believe in psychiatry, for example, uh, a lot of people did nights and then they had like uh, uh, support from the uh, specialist, uh, which we call Bokhur. And then you do like, uh, you can talk to the specialist via telephone. Um, and in that way, you have like a passive uh, supervision all the time. So 
that's the important so you're, you're, not, you're never left alone yeah uh, that's that's the message that's that's very important so this checklist that you're having in your head is it always signed by that same person that is passively monitoring you or does it depend uh, you on have exactly you like what you do in your estate you have like uh, different sort of modules so once you do your like for example you say acute placement then it's your uh, supervisor from the acute placement that signs off that you have um, certain competencies that you have filled and I likewise see. if you are in the psychiatry then there is a like a supervisor from the psychiatry department and then on top of that you have a like a what we call a hoover handle that is some someone like who's basically following you in like in a bigger picture and like he's... in Este, we have a mentor basically that exactly. does all the time and then yeah at the end of the year he will sign off everything he'll just see what you have done in different uh, placements and then he'll sign off the ultimate uh, uh, certificate that you need to send to the uh, social students and that's that's really 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 good Okay, so um, if we summarize things just so far, the ebete is basically an extra cherry on top of your este, uh, and it entails you doing certain or completing certain tasks within a checklist that is required by the social citizen. Mm -hmm. You can either do it by applying through um, a package deal, basically with primary health uh, clinics, or um, by if you want to apply for something within the hospital realm and you want to continue your field in the hospital you can mm. apply to these tailored programs as well for you there mm. and depending on what they're offering mm. that's really good and uh, like you said it is paid and the pay isn't that much of a huge difference mm. uh, than what you'd get as a resident so uh, what are we talked about the strengths and positives of, of the beta what are the downsides to it that you experience uh the downsides would be the first one would be that you're paid a little bit less. That's the first downside. And the next downside is that it's going to be, sadly, it's the same problem that we had with Ote, uh, that there are a lot of candidates that want to get in and a few places. Uh, and especially if you're like reserve, no, nah, I don't want to work in like Gothenburg or Stockholm or uh, like uh, Malmo. You don't have a lot of positions. Uh, the last I remember, there were like 12 positions and there were like 120 candidates applying for those 12 positions and the recruitment criteria i don't really understand i have never understood the recruitment criteria in sweden it's not like it's it's very much based on now i don't want to say how do you do it but it's like random i would say you don't know how if you're going to get selected or not and so that's that's one of the basic you know, big negatives i would say and then certain people uh, would not be able to do stuff that they probably want to do. Uh, for example, someone who is a specialist in, let's say, radiology, he has no interest in working in the psychiatry clinic. But uh, if he wants to continue his position in psychiatry, he still has to go through the psychiatry. I mean, imagine a radiologist working in psychiatry. That would be like, you know... <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you understand. You, you would have to I, do a I, lot I, of. I do, I do understand. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I think um, these are very very valid points. Um, what do you think of the length of this period? Do you uh, do you feel that six months is a good time or it went by fast? For I you? would say six months is uh, is intensive for someone who has never worked in Sweden. My uh, very very. A strong recommendation is, would be one year is is the is a good sweet spot there for someone who has worked but has not started their estate in sweden they don't have to do one year they then six months is sufficient for, enough for them how about when you do mistakes do are they lenient with you in the beginning do they like is it a bit of positive reinforcement or are they quite tough the the point is there you are expected to make mistakes even as a resident because uh, you're the point of residency is that you are learning there and you're like trying to grow yourself and um, uh, but you, you you need to understand that okay uh, there are like certain there are patients that we are dealing with it's not something that we are like in a in a factory that if something goes wrong and nothing happens you have to take the consequences and it's the same everywhere. What you have is that as a beta lacquer, you're expected to ask everything uh, before you do it. 
So if you're at a psychiatry clinic and you have a patient who's like, you know, if and uh, and you don't really know what you're going to do with it, just go and ask your colleague. They're they're there to support you. And the biggest mistake that you can do is try to show that you can do a lot more than you can than you actually can. Uh, And you don't get like any plus points for being the best doctor. Um, but you do get plus points for asking every each and everything. They know they, they get scared when you don't ask. So my st- my strongest recommendation is uh, take your history, take your like um, examination, think about it yourself, make a plan, go and discuss it with your supervisor, and see if you, there was something that you didn't plan. And then he will feel secure, and you will feel secure, and uh, hopefully the patient would not be. Uh, in a like fragile position so you're not expected is, uh, to take patients on your own 100 without questioning yeah, anything yeah that's yeah. not that's not the idea here yeah that would uh, think actually this is probably probably one of the best advice anyone whether it's a PT, um, a doctor for doing their crisco proof or a resident even or even a specialist mm-hmm. Hmm. Even now, finishing my my residency and starting out as a new specialist, I still ask. I ask people that have more experience than I am. Like uh, like uh, they would just mention, um, in the end of the day, you're not dealing with merchandise. You're dealing with human beings. You're dealing with people that can be your relatives. That you hmm. can be sitting in their place one day. You hmm. want to be sure that what you're doing, if you're unsure of, is the right thing and the best thing you can do. And in Sweden, this is maybe different in other countries and other places, asking is encouraged and it shows that you're a good team player and you're caring for the patient more than your sense of pride of knowing or not knowing. That, yeah, uh, that's, right. that's the first thing that they would realize. And that's one of yeah. the things that uh, culturally we have a little bit different in Sweden from a lot of countries that in a lot of countries you're expected to if you ask someone there, you're like looked down upon uh, that you don't know. But here is the opposite. Even if you know, it's never wrong to like uh, take a second opinion. L- like you said, even specialists or like even if you're a consultant, it's very often that they're like, oh, I have a patient and that's how I think. What do you think? Uh, and sometimes uh, even like a very, very junior doctor can give a like a suggestion that everyone accepts. So that's that's how the system works. Thank you very, very much. And I'm sure all the viewers are thanking you right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I mean, uh, I understand. I mean, uh, when you're new, you don't really have the resources and everything is like hidden and a lot of links and reading and stuff like that and people saying different stuff. But uh, my take-home message would be just like do your own research. You don't rely on anyone. Oh, he said that I don't have to do it. I do have to do it. It's you uh, who's gonna uh, suffer at the end if you if you don't take a wise decision right now. Big uh, disclaimer, just here to to drop this in. Like Oda is saying, please and always. Uh, what we're saying right now maybe is dependent on the Wood's experience, on my experience, and take on the matter. But always, always refer to the social students at all times and ask and direct your questions to them and to the other uh, to the other governmental uh, agencies to double check information because things can always change and they can always be updated. So, of course, what we're telling you is not false, but it's based on our experiences. But take everything with a grain of salt and double check everything that you are unsure of. And you would need that sort of uh, mindset uh, even when you start working here. Uh, I'm pretty sure Anis can um, uh, tell you about that, that you are responsible for applying a lot of courses and like saying that, okay, this is what I need to get uh, done before I apply for like a specialist. Uh, uh, And it's just a lot of like responsibility on your shoulders. No one is going to like say, okay, here is everything for you. It's not going to happen like that. Very well said. We wish all our viewers the best of success and the best of luck. And uh, uh, if Dawood would would be uh, open to receive some messages from you guys in the future. Absolutely. Drop a link. Thank you so much. And Uh, uh, I will. Thank you so much. And uh, what I can say, uh, the the last point that I wanted to uh, like put in, in front of everyone 
the differences between the old uh, training and the new training. Uh, so if you do the new ST2021, you don't have to do what we call for like a qualitet uh, that you don't have to do anymore in the new ST2021. Uh, and the ST is like, uh, they have uh, increased it from five years to five and a half years. Uh, and the extra six months is they're uh, thinking that is supposed to be the the beta. So basically, yes, this stays the same. The extra five months, uh, six months, you have to do the beta. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Thank you, my friend. With that, I'm gonna say a huge thank you and appreciation as well from all the people that are watching. If you guys found this content to be helpful, share and like so others can as well benefit. And uh, write in the comment section, thank you to Dr. Dawood here. Wish you all the best of luck for our future colleague in ophthalmology and hope to be in touch very, very soon. Thank you very much.